Please join me in, work in welcoming Ron Suskind. Well, let me tell you sort of how this book started and how I end up where I am now uh, as uh, an enemy of the state again. I'm actually, the White House didn't like the book. Um, I don't think that's any surprise, you know. Again, I come from a school of reporters that sometimes when you get the goods, you know, it's like kicking a, a hornet's nest. The hornets come after you. Often shows you did something right. Nowadays with the blogs and a lot of sort of political media practitioners taking sides, it's a little more complicated, but, you know, um, the, um, so my trip here today is actually being sponsored, I don't know if many told you, by the Federal Witness Relocation Program. <laughs> They'll never find him in Miami. <laughs> no, I don't mean that. Um, so, so this is a, a journey, this book here, this book, uh, is a cover when you buy it. I took the cover off. Um, it starts uh, at a kind of starting point. You know, when you're writing books, uh, you got to kind of say, where do you begin? You know, the starting point is always a bit of a fiction anyway. Whatever begins anywhere. You know, what comes first? There's nothing new under the sun. We've been as we are for thousands of years doing mostly the same things. But you got to pick a moment. And I pick uh, August of 2007 because things are happening in terms of the key actors of the moment. Uh, at that point, on August 1st, uh, Barack Obama, 07 now, is 30 points behind Hillary Clinton, and he's very tetchy, and he's kind of not the guy you know now. He's an impatient it's like, oh, I got no chance. What am I thinking? He sits down with an economic team, because he is running for president at that point, albeit, you know, an oddity, a great speaker. Yes, we know that from the 04 convention, of course, an amazing speech. But, you know, it doesn't seem like he has much of a chance. He's got a funny name. And he's sitting with his economic team, and they brief him. And it's a pretty interesting team already. And through the campaign, just to telegraph a little bit, he had a pretty extraordinary team of advisors. A lot of them didn't make it into the White House, which is a theme of the book. But this team sort of advises him, says, Mr. President, at that point, Mr. Senator, they say, Barack, Senator Obama, the economy looks okay with these numbers like GDP and unemployment, but inflation, but these yardsticks don't really tell the story because, you know, it's almost like, um, you know, the, the core of the economy is a little rotted out, filled with debt. It's like a house with the cross beams starting to give. And there's a fresh coat of paint on the house, Mr. Senator, which is debt. Well, they're living on debt. We've got higher percentages of debt, uh, more than GDP, 120% of GDP, than we've ever had. It's usually about 40, 50, 60%. So this is where much of American life is being housed economically, in these rickety shacks. Fresh coat of paint, but rotted underneath. One strong wind. They're going down. Hmm. That is interesting. He sees it. Four days later, the other part of the opening of the book, I won't read it to you, but I'll just kind of riff it for you, is uh, he is, um, it's his 46th birthday. Obama's 46th birthday. And, uh, and there's a, a character in the book who calls Obama up on his birthday. Now, Obama is down in Atlanta. He's speaking at the Southern Christian Leadership Council, Martin Luther King's organization, uh, at a big do they're having. Of course, he's going to summon King, as he often does in these days, his hero, uh, obviously a real American hero for many people. And he gets a call of an extraordinary call. It's from a guy who's a big fundraiser of his. He's kind of leading the Wall Street fundraisers. A guy named Robert Wolf. He's the head of UBS in America, a real Wall Street titan, a big guy. And he's out raising a lot of money on Wall Street for Obama. He's like, you know, he's the tumbler. He's, you know, he's putting his hands on him. Come on, give it up, give it up. And, uh, and so he's out on August 4th on a boat. Uh, owned by a hedge fund manager who used to work for him at UBS. This guy, Sal Narrow. A lot of them are ethnic guys. And, uh, you know, Wolf is a Jewish guy who played football. Narrow's an Italian guy who played football. And, uh, and they're on this boat because Narrow runs a big hedge fund. And, uh, and, uh, uh, and the boat is a, a 110 foot 
Lazara. Now, uh, that's a boat. Uh, it costs about nine uh, million bucks. It's got four staterooms, a library, and a desalinization system on the boat. So you can go across the Atlantic on this baby. Right. Some of you have boats like that here, being informed? <laughs> Show of hands. And so Wolf steps on the boat and seeing his buddy, the wives are there. They're going like on a two day cruise. The wives have set this up weeks in advance. And Narrow's having a meltdown, screaming into the phone, things that I cannot say to a family audience here because his hedge fund is melting. It's the first real shock in terms of the global economy going south. You know, people have worried about this for a while. The way debt gets packaged, the great giant debt machine. It had built into it kind of, uh, you know, flaws. People knew uh, it would catch up with us eventually. They feared it. Well, Sal Narrow's getting the first shock. You know, if there are cardiologists in the room, this is the first moment when someone goes, mm, was it an egg roll? What did I eat, honey? What did I eat? So, so Narrow sees it. He says, the whole thing's collapsing. Wolfie, they're buddies. Wolfie, this is the nightmare. It's coming. Lays it out. Wolf is a former trader. He's a Solomon Brothers. They talk trader to trader. And Wolf sees it. The whole thing's coming apart. He goes up to the flying deck of this boat. It's got like four decks. And on the top is a pool from a flying deck. And he calls up Barack Obama for his birthday. Hey, young man, how are you? Happy birthday. And they talk about their wives and they talk about their kids. And he says, you know, Barack, I have not been an advisor to you. I'm a, I'm a money guy. But you ought to see what I'm seeing from where I'm standing. Because Wolf is really standing on the flying deck of a golden era that is soon to end. And he explains it to Obama in plain English. We're leveraged up 40, 50 times. We took the short money. We've acted recklessly, all of us on Wall Street. And it's not just Wall Street. It's the financial capital of America, which is, in a way, the financial capital of the world. And we knew it was going to catch up, and it has. Barack, it's a market-driven disaster. It's going to melt the global economy. It's a once-in-a-lifetime kind of event. After a few minutes of this, Obama says, hey, happy birthday, huh? Thanks for the present. And then Obama gets serious and says, look, Wolf, I want you to be an advisor now. You're going to be my Wall Street source. Tell me everything you know. And he does. Obama gets this most precious thing, a glimpse of the future. And he is ahead of everybody ahead of every politician in America, and frankly, most folks who are not even politicians. And he leaps out, again, 30 points behind. Obama's doing, you know, in the fall of 2007, we got to restructure Wall Street, financial reform, they're out of control, let's step up. Of course, most people didn't hear him at that point. But then after he storms through Iowa, and everyone watches that, people probably remember watching that acceptance speech in Iowa, and you can see everyone's eyes readjusting. Wait a minute, an African-American guy just won a 94% white state. And the speech he gave, that speech was like a song. I mean, of, of America. No red states or blue states. No red, one America from Selma and Montgomery right to now. Who are we? I mean, you hear it. It's, it was an aria. And he was flying forward that spring. I mean, it's amazing when you go back and report it and you talk to everyone looking back, you know, and they're like, it was like a dream. He gives a speech at Cooper Union in New York in the spring. It was like, touch the hem of my garment. It was like RFK a, a month before. You know, the hands. And who does he have around him? Well, he's got this bipartisan, in this era, of partisan division, a bipartisan team, ecumenical. Paul Volcker, you know, six foot eight. You know, tough love. 
the king of tough love, former Fed chairman, as Greenspan is collapsing as the great Fed chairman at this point, because they realize, people say, what Greenspan's been doing was creating a bubble and then just moving the bubble for 20 years. Why? Because when these bubbles burst, they were littler, then they got bigger and even bigger, they caused a contraction. It's politically really inconvenient, right? Well, hmm, Greenspan's innovation. Let's make sure the bubble never bursts. Just keep moving it. Gonna keep getting bigger. We'll go from internet bubble to mortgage bubble. Ooh, that's a big one. Well, that bursts. And who's standing up there as the great Fed chairman of the 20th century, Paul Volcker? And who's he standing behind, Barack Obama? And who's around him? He's got Bill Donaldson, the SEC chief under Bush, a Republican. Volcker's been a Republican most of his life. He's got Robert Reich, the liberal labor secretary under Bill Clinton. He's got Joe Stiglitz, who, of course, is a bomb thrower, you know, on the left. He's got Robert Wolf, Wall Street titan. How does this happen? Well, they're scared. These are honest brokers, the kind you hope for. They see the great ship, USA, is going toward a waterfall. Bear Stearns just went down. We got to do something. They're advising Obama, tough love, restructure Wall Street, the pump house, the energy supply for the US economy. It's going to be tough. The political capital's broken. We know that. It's been broken for a long time. The financial capital's broken. We know that now. Use the political capital to correct the financial capital, and you can be Roosevelt. Restore the Roosevelt to Reagan standards of the prudent men, the tough love, tough rules with teeth. It wasn't regulatory discretion. That's now. Law, legal, illegal, like a brick wall. So what happens? Well, the guys on Wall Street take one look at this scenario in the summer of 08 and said, oh my God, if this guy gets to be president, this Obama, with this team around him, we on Wall Street are toast. We got to do something and fast. Now, Wall Street understands strategy and tactics. So they said, we got to get our team in the key spots if this guy gets elected. And they move forcefully and quickly. Team Rubin, I call them. Bob Rubin, you know, former Goldman chief, Treasury Secretary under Clinton, godfather of this whole group. And at this point, uh, the Citigroup chairman, he and his team move. Well, it's like a panzer division. They get Larry Summers, former Treasury Secretary, former Harvard president, and a lovely, cuddly kind of fellow. <laughs> God. They go, <laughs> and Larry, Larry basically is gonna be the linchpin. This is clear. And so, so uh, one of their friends uh, gets a big job in the summer. This guy, uh, Jason Furman, Austin Goolsby, also part of the original team, very dynamic, ecumenical, you know, follows the data, very interesting economist. He gets pushed out, a new guy gets put in, he's kind of a Reuben guy, and he basically says to Larry, I can get you to the table in the summer of 08. And then you got to do the rest. Ooh, not a problem. Jason, you get me to the table. I know what to do from there. And he did. By the time the election arrives, Team Rubin is ready. Now let's talk about our main guy, though. Because this is not about the advisors. We only care about the advisors insofar as they give us a glimpse of the leader. That's who we care about. He's the central actor of this period. It's hard not to feel sympathetic toward Obama, and I exhibit a lot of sympathy in this book, despite what some of the earlier reviews may have uh, suggested. I try to do that with all my characters through all the books. Know why they do what they do. You know, that first book, uh, Hope in the Unseen, uh, that, w that we were talking about, uh, is where I'm, I follow a kid from a blighted urban high school to Brown University. You know, I spent a lot of time with gang leaders and things like that. I was in some pretty tough corners of America. And I found that I was judging them. You know, or the pastor at the kid's church, you know, who was kind of a scoundrel. 
you know, he had a Rolls Royce and it was the poor section of Washington and all that. And, but you know, I started to think more clearly. I said, look, if I'm judging this man, and swiftly and maybe harshly, it's because I don't know the good enough reasons for what he does. And this is what I call my good enough reasons rule. People do what they do for good enough reasons. Good enough that intent flows to action the thing you can see. Know those reasons. They may not be your reasons or mine, but they're good enough. If you can know them, you can know a person almost as well as you can know another. Even if it seems you have nothing in common with them. The good enough reasons rule. I need to understand why these actors do what they do. And Obama, coming through the fall, he kind of, he, he shudders. He gets a cold sweat. And how could he not? You know, the man had no experience managing anything. He'd run his one-man show his whole life. You know, in the Illinois Senate, one of Axelrod and one of saying, he, doesn't, he didn't even have one staffer. They share, he shared one with another legislator. He had half a staffer. And all of a sudden, he's on the top of a wave. And, and I was there with my wife, my beloved, uh, on the last rally of the campaign. It was in Manassas, Virginia, right near where I live in Washington. 21-month run to glory, Obama. Extraordinary character. And this was his last speech as a candidate. You know, it was 10.30 at night. It was the night his grandmother died. He was hoarse. He was exhausted. There were 100,000 people in a field in the middle of nowhere, four miles from where 147 years before the rebel yell rolled across these hills to start an earlier chapter in our long American experiment, often troubled, but forward moving still. And now a black man, an African American, steps up on that stage. And I can hear that noise, the cheer. I can hear it now. Everyone was there. It wasn't just professionals from Washington like me. It took us five hours to go 20 miles. It was people who can't afford to live in Washington, in trailer parks in Northern Virginia, African-American, Latino-American, Asian-American, and guys with cat diesel hats and pickup trucks and gun racks and Confederate flags, they were there. It's hard not to feel a kind of ennui, a loss. What was that? We were part of it, right? People painted their yearnings on him. Of course, how could we not? People were terrified. He seemed to be able to be a vessel for those hopes. The next night in Grand Park, the night of the election, well, that speech was a little different. That was kind of flat, remember? Good speech, fine. Already, Obama stepping away. Waited for this his whole life. Wrote his autobiography at 33. Already saying to Axelrod, no fireworks, too celebratory. No fireworks in Grand Park. Gives the speech. It's going to be tough. I don't want you to expect too much. It's kind of what the speech says. And then he, he walks off the stage, and Michelle's waiting, and she puts her hand up for a high five. It's her moment, too. And he grabs her hand and pulls it down and says, not tonight. Not tonight. He's got to own Washington, tame New York, save us from what could be a depression. Wow. But something happens after you know, sort of the same thing on Inauguration Day. That flat inaugural speech, not an inspiring speech. People were a little disappointed, but they were there. That's all they wanted. They wanted to see it. And then he gets into the Oval Office. And it's, it's amazing to see what happens. Because Obama's a guy who plans everything out. He's got this what I call pre-planning, pre-packaging problem. He, he packages the game, plays it in his head before he, and he steps in the field. You know, you see this as president. Well, he couldn't have imagined one thing, what it would be like to actually be the president. Though he dreamed about it his whole life. He gets into that Oval Office, that cornerless room. And he's like, wait a minute, I, I, can, do, I can do this, I can, be, I can do it. And right off the bat, he's kind of forceful. 
He doesn't, he says, I want to do health care first. That's a complex issue. We'll, we could talk about that later during the Q&A. But mostly, he says, we are in an existential crisis, a melting economy, a half a million jobs lost every month, a collapsed financial system, a jobs crisis yawning up like a giant wave. What do I do? What happens? Well, you know, he's smart. And he's reading, and he's running up learning curves as fast as he can. And he finds himself in a kind of contest with two key actors who are in the book, Larry Summers, who we've talked about, and Tim Geithner, the current Treasury Secretary. Larry and Tim are old friends. They play tennis together. They all serve Clinton together. They've known each other forever. And they both believe in a principle. They call it, in a catchphrase, Hippocratic risk. First, do no harm. This is kind of a corollary to the principles of market efficiency, almost like a religious concept. That the markets always figure it out. They always work. Let them do what they will do. This, of course, is the philosophy across several decades. What is government's role? Just get out of the way. Hippocratic risk is when you're thinking about trying something, first, first, do no harm. That's the first principle. Hmm. This is a very tough rhetorical position to challenge. But Obama tries it. He's reading Krugman, like you, you are. He's reading it in the newspaper. Has Krugman, a, has Krugman a, a made, put out a paper on this stuff? Can I get the paper? He's like self-schooling. Why? He wants to be able to challenge Larry in the debates in the White House. Obama thought he would oversee the policy process. Uh, and in, instead, he, he's uh, just the guy at the table of the Larry Summers Debate Society. <laughs> Obama, you know, he's sit, you sit there. And he comes up with it. I want to be Roosevelt. So what does he come up with? Catchphrase is pretty simple. Anyone can understand this. I want to be like Sweden and not Japan. Now, what's that? Sweden nationalized its banks. They had a big bubble, just like we did the bubble burst. They tried to bail out their banks. It didn't work. And then they nationalized them. They're like, wait a minute. You guys are not even bankers anymore. You're like casino operators. You've got to be bankers. We're going to kill off wild speculation as the business model of the banks in Sweden. And we're going to restore the prudent men, boring spine of the economy. It's going to be 363, just like it was. You give them 3% of their deposits, you lend it out at 6%, and you go play golf at 3 o'clock. I don't know, do they play golf in Sweden? I don't know. Whatever they do in Sweden at 3 o'clock, that's what they're going to do. Or Japan. Sweden roared back once they did that. They got right out of their recession. Japan, no, no, the banks are special. The government will support them in whatever way necessary, whatever money they got. Bailout after bailout, and that created two decades of stagnation in Japan, just like we have now. We're just in year three now. Obama gets it. Geithner is challenging him in the meetings. No, Mr. President, Mr. President, these analogies, they're not quite, they, some caveats. No, Obama, yeah, I got it, I got it. Caveats. I think the concept's clear. I want to be Sweden, not Japan. And that's what Obama wants to do. Even Larry Summers, who is an ambitious man, sort of says, oh, I think the president made a decision here. I'm going to go on his side. And he does. Usually Larry and Tim are together. Now they're apart. Obama's rising to his historical challenge. Big meeting in March in the book. It's reported like a scene out of a movie. Everyone cooperated with this book, as you probably have heard. Everyone's taped. Thank God. And um, <laughs> And, uh, and Obama says, I get it. I want to take down the too big to fail banks. We don't need them. You don't need a $2 trillion bank to make money. That's, that's caca. And these banks are unmanageable. And what's the real fear? The real fear in the economy is we'll have another Lehman-style disaster. Uncontrollable, freezing up the global credit system, which is busted. We know that now. We go through it every day now. And killing off that fear by showing government can do something right to step up, well, that will free people. 
to feel more confident, to invest, to grow, to say things are going to work out up ahead. That's what we need. He gets it. Geithner basically looks at him and says, that duly elected leader doesn't know what the hell he's talking about. And I am not going to let it happen. That's what he does. You know, Geithner was there in the previous fall with Hank Paulson and Ben Bernanke. None of these other people were. Sort of like Geithner's 9-11 moment. I was there at 9-11 when Lehman failed. That's the economic equivalent. You guys weren't. This won't work. So what does he do? Well, in a big giant meeting, the president says, Tim, you want to do your stress test, which is a thing where it support the banks, just like Japan, basically. But I want an alternative. And what it comes down to is boil down, I'm just going to take down Citigroup, the biggest of the offenders. He can do it with $200 billion in the, currently in the TARP fund from the previous fall, you know, the bailout fund, had about 350 in it, $200 billion. That's all it would take to do Citi. And then we can do that right and go back to Congress for more money to do the whole system. Tim, I want a plan for how to unwind city. That's where the meeting ends on March 15th. Almost a month later, there's a meeting in the Oval Office. Uh, Geithner's not there. He's got other engagements. Everyone else is. And Obama says, you know, what about this city bank plan? What about unwinding that plan? That, that city plan, taking down city, that's the key to our arsenal. That's going to be the key. Now, at this moment, Christina Romer, Chief of the Council of Economic Advisors, looks over at Larry Summers, and they look back and forth nervously at each other in the Oval Office. And she's like, Ugh, do I tell him or not? And she says, he's the president. He ought to know. Uh, Mr. President, uh, not to tell you this, but there, there, there is no plan for city. They haven't, they just didn't do one. Well, there better be. He's, he's, he's upset. At this moment, Christina feels Rom's eyes on her. You know, one of those things, you know. I'm looking at you. Rahm Emanuel, you know him, right? The guy with, you know, he's missing the middle finger, that guy. Obama had a really good line about that when they're in Chicago together. There's some testimony on like 04, and he's talking about when Rom lost his finger in some kind of, I don't know what the accident was. And he says, you know, but, and when he lost that middle finger, he, he, was, he was rendered mute at that point. <laughs> gotta like, the guy's got great timing. He really, he's got, Obama's got terrific chops. Well, Rom, you know, he's chief of staff. He's like, meeting ends. Rom and Larry, they both served Clinton together, known each other forever. They huddle. And uh, Rahm is livid. And, and Larry Summers is seeing Christy another 15 minutes later. He says, oh, Chris, Christy, Rahm is pissed. You know, that you would say that. He said, I can't believe she said that about the Citibank. No city, without, without Tim there to defend himself. And Larry says, but Christy, I, I defended you. I said, but Rahm, she's right. Slow walking. Sometimes presidents get ignored by their staff. They're experts. National security, economics, that's why they're hired. They're smarter than the president in their chosen fields. But the way our system works, in pretty much for every president, was when the president makes a decision. Whether you agree or disagree, you've got to line up to execute it. That's the way the whole thing operates. He's the duly elected leader. You serve at his pleasure. It didn't happen here because these guys felt this man was not ready for prime time. Tim, Larry, and Rahm, especially those three. I talked to the president about this. I talked to everyone about it. I said, what did you say to Tim the next time you saw him? This is arguably the most important decision you made in your early presidency. Clearly, you were agitated. He says, well, I don't, I'm not sure if agitated is the word I'd use. I'm like, pick any word you want. What, what did you say? What were you feeling? And he talked about they were moving slower, the bureaucracy was moving slower than I wanted, and these things are hard. And what happened here is that Obama kind of got the wind knocked out of him. And you see it through the year as we go through the book and you know where you see him starting to waver 
losing that preternatural confidence. It's really the core of what got him elected, that, that ability to stand up straight and tall and make his points clear as an unmuddied lake. I can handle it. Just trust me. I got judgment. Hillary may have experience. Remember that debate, experience versus judgment, Hillary versus Barack? Hillary said experience. Obama said judgment. I think if Obama was standing uh, with us here on the stage, he's like, you, you know, experience is also kind of important as well. Um, he didn't have any. Now, I'm just going to jump forward because that year was a tough year, and it's all in the book. Healthcare drifted. He said, that's my number one priority. They didn't do anything. They gave it up to the Senate, to the Tea Party, then jobs. Clearly, the, the stimulus didn't work. That was clear by the spring. It wasn't big enough. It should have been almost twice as large. Bad analysis. They just blew it. You know, it's not like it was unknowable, but this is a financial recession. It's not like the recessions from the 80s or earlier recessions. When there's a financial crisis attached to the recession, it takes longer to recover and it's harder to recover. It means you need more money to, to throw on kindling and get the logs lit in terms of stimulus. They didn't do it. They knew that. But here we are, meeting after meeting, and you've got some people saying we've got to be deficit hawks, Mr. President, and others saying we need stimulus, and he simply couldn't make the tough call. All the way through to when Scott Brown, Massachusetts, wins a surprise, and Obama loses his precious supermajority in Congress, he had that extraordinary opportunity and he goes to his staff, dispirited in January of 2010, he says, I've lost my narrative. I have no narrative. That's like someone saying, for Obama, saying like, I've lost my identity. And all of a sudden, there's a, there's a bit of light, a change. A shadow chief of staff, a guy named Pete Rouse, a top advisor, he was a brilliant guy, he served Obama in the Senate as his chief of staff, former chief of staff to Dom, Tom Daschle, the majority leader. He's kind of Obama's inside guy. He's been watching all this for the first year. He starts writing some memos that are in the book. And the memos are very tough-minded. Rouse is good at this. And he basically says, look, Mr. President, when the Treasury Department or the economic team disagrees with one of your decisions, they relitigate the overall policy, meaning they ignore you. And even when they are forced to accept your decision, they often slow execution. They slow walk it until nothing happens. You need to establish accountability. You need to own this building. Basically, you need to kick some butt. You are the president. And these memos stretching through 2010 kind of form a blueprint that means most of the staff he brought to Washington out the door. And I'll just finish by saying that Obama well, you know, I went into the White House after this long reporting period, and I sat down with them. I said, Here's what, here are the goods. Here are the disclosures. Here's what I got. And they're like, oi, 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 oi. I'm not sure that's not a quote, so don't quote me there, but it's very similar. And I'm like, they're like, but look, this is past tense. The president has grown. This is after the midterms. You know, Obama got shellacked, but he looks back and he says, I kind of, uh, I got some, uh, I got a hit that clarified things. He gets out, he does the Bush tax cuts, says I don't agree with that, but I got a half a trillion dollars of stimulus for it. He's kind of taking control. There's no doubt about that. Stuff he had Biden, you said Biden do, he's doing himself. You know, I'm going to broker this deal with my own hands. And then he gives that great speech in Tucson with Gabby Giffords. I don't know if you saw that, but it was, you know, a thing of beauty. It was the last time we had a guy who could do that. I mean, really, something special. And that's what Obama thought he'd do more of as president, bring us together. Didn't have much of a chance for that. And then when I'm interviewing him, uh, he's, he's got Bin Laden in the crosshairs earlier this year. He's got a new staff. He says, I got the staff I need to be the president I need to be. I learned hard lessons, you know, often against my will from these difficult times. And watch me now. That's where the White House was in the spring they were ready to own all the truths in this book. And then uh, the debt ceiling thing hit at the end of the summer. 
And all of a sudden they said, it seems like that third act of his resurrection, well, it seems like it's all act two, the disaster. Nothing's changed. And that's why they attacked the book. It's expected, it comes with the territory. But then the question goes back to Obama, more than ever. It's not his staff, it's him. Can he grow? Can he rise? Having said that, I will just finish with saying I don't disbelieve Obama. You know, in that final interview, he's, he's quite open and searching and thinking out loud. You know, we've had this battle. We have two capitals. We have, really, since the beginning of the republic. New York and Washington, the financial capital and the political capital, been fighting it out for primacy, for direction of the, the great experiment of the ship of state. You know, Obama says, I'm ready. I'm ready to be more Rooseveltian. I'm ready to do things that will be of historical note. He says it in the interview. Paul Volcker, who's a hero of the book, he's all over the book. You know, he's like, first do no harm. What are you kidding? Yeah, when I was choking off money supply in 1979 to kill inflation, you know how many people said first do no harm in their own crazy way? If I'd listened to him, I wouldn't have done anything. He's clear. If you're going to do something bold, you're going to do some harm to someone, to existing constituencies and interests that have profited from a broken landscape that you're hoping to change. Yeah, they're going to, they're going to feel some harm. No, you've got to decide. Is government's role to soften the blow for those people or not? That's a different issue. But first, do no harm. What, are you kidding? The whole point is to take a stand, to change the course. Not to just balance interests like on weights and measures on scales as they exist now. Wall Street is extraordinary might. Those who've made good in the last 30 years have more financial clout than they ever had since the Depression. Put that on a scale. And forget one man, one vote. It's now one buck, one vote. Especially after that Supreme Court ruling where essentially corporations are now individuals. You can contribute as much as you want. As long as money is considered constitutionally the same as speech, how did that ever happen? You can't stop it. Well, that's where we are. If you're just going to balance those things on your scale, you're basically going to get the same path from which we've come. It'll be the same drift. Do you think something like Occupy Wall Street, which I've been very fortunate to be a part of and you know, encourage everyone to support, is that something that establishes a constituency for the kind of actions that you said he was reluctant to take? Yeah, absolutely. Occupy Wall Street is just, I mean, it's fascinating stuff. And, and I think it gets right to this issue that our, our other questioner asked about, is that people see the political process as gridlocked. And that's when you get the Tea Party, too. They're kind of distant cousins. They don't agree on much, but it's not that different. Like, I don't know, do something. Take to the streets. When people start taking to the streets, it means that they're f trying to find an alternative to what seems like a political system that's not meeting their needs. This is the way it, when it happens. It happened during the Vietnam War, not that different. And I think that when that occurs, it shows a kind of health in terms of the way public life gets conducted. Yeah, and they are having effect. There's no doubt about it. I mean, it's interesting because you see again and again something that I find in the book, Obama having to be kind of dragged kicking and screaming to do a lot of things that maybe even he seemed to have promised early on. You know, and there's a lot of that in the book. He's kind of a little bit of the reluctant president here. And the Occupy Wall Street guys are going, come on. We're trying to carry forward your oath in terms of what you said that got you elected. But you can see the conflict. You know, talk is cheap. You know, can you do the walk? And there are a lot of things in this book that Obama says he wanted to do in meetings. And he was kind of talked down by Larry Summers and Tim Geithner. Tim's still there. And it's stuff that Occupy Wall Street wants to do. I'll just throw one out, because it's made some, gotten some publicity because of the disclosures in the book. The financial transaction tax. Okay, this has been around for a long time. Basically it says, 
If you don't like something, tax it. It reduces it. You tax transactions. You try to at least tamp down the wild speculative model that has moved our financial system away from real investment. You know, remember Warren Buffett and Peter Lynch and that whole era in the 80s? They were up against Mike Milken and those guys. They were early financial engineers, right? There was a battle was starting then. Buffett, find inherent value, you know, something intrinsic, buy and hold. <laughs> what are you kidding? Hold it for as long as just don't and look away. Don't even go and look at the stock page. Peter Lynch, too. Remember, Rand Magellan. His thing was, I, I talked to my wife today. She bought something she loves. I'm going to invest in it for Magellan. What was that was about? It created a great participatory energy to the whole thing. That's been killed off. You know, the financial transaction tax, and it'll kick off $150 billion a year. Seems like a no brainer, right? Obama wanted to do it. And at one point, Larry Summers, who doesn't believe in these sort of market interventions, turns to Peter Orzag, who was the head of OMB, and he says, I'm not letting him do it. He doesn't know what he's doing. It ain't going to happen. It didn't happen. Talk is cheap. The question is, what will Obama do? People are sort of, they've shorted his rhetoric. Questions, other ones? No, hey. Yes. Uh, you, you mentioned that uh, the new court decision that speech is money, yeah. or money is speech. And it's my understanding that the bulk, not the bulk, but the primary support that Obama got financially in the election was from Wall Street, financial, yeah. banks, and so yeah. forth. Yeah. So how much of that uh, played a role in his decisions, and how much do you think that's going to influence him going forward? That's a great question. So you're getting, you're, you're jumping ahead of me. You're sort of answering that you're getting right to the core issue here. You know, because both Romney and Obama are raising money pell-mell on Wall Street. Obama raised a lot of money in 08. But again, he raised money then when those guys were scared. In a way, they haven't been scared since they were in third grade, most of them. <laughs> that was good. Fear was good. Then it passed. Tim Geithner says, let the banks earn their way back to health. And the bonuses, boom, wowee. Once the bonuses came back, there was no way you were going to get them to do anything. You'd have to basically wrestle them to the ground. But, you know, it gets right to this issue. You know, you make choices. Eh, choices matter. Part of me saying, I don't know. I mean, I, obviously, I'm not a presidential advisor, but people do ask, why do you just say, I don't want their money? I don't want, Obama, I don't want Wall Street's money. I don't want it. I am the president. I don't need their money. I have the bully pulpit. I've got the best stage on the planet. Why do I need their money? For what? But, you know, you take the money, you lose the ability to summon moral outrage, kind of. That's the problem. And they know that, which is why they're standing there with their checks for you. You know, I think what, what happens is, is that, um, is that in some ways, the transparency we see now is not necessarily the best thing in the world. When you get a lot of these guys in private, which I do sometimes, they're like, oh, my life is a nightmare. And I wish I could be like a grown up and follow the stuff where it leads. They know right from wrong. You know, but also, you know, they profit from often not exhibiting that in public. Um, you know, I mean, part of what the, the moment demanded was that Obama did have a chance to really call him out. They were scared in those first six months of 09. And interestingly, this is something I think would hearten you if you're a Republican, is that, is that what I found in the reporting is that you had both Republicans and Democrats coming to Obama saying, step up, especially on financial restructuring. It's an amazing moment I found in the book, because at the end in the reporting, I was talking to Rahm Emanuel, he's like, I gave the president good advice, he didn't always heed it. And so I said, well, give me an example. He's like, well, after Tim Geithner's stress test, basically Japan, after that pretty much was underway, we knew the banks were going to go and make a lot of money. But before they did, I was getting Republican senators in the spring of 09. It's fascinating. Richard Shelby, others, you know, conservatives, going to Rahm Emanuel saying, no, let's do it now. Let's just get it over with. Tough financial reform, even restructuring. Yeah. Republicans and Democrats together. Because, you know, there's a lot of political capital to harvest, right? 
You know, there were buses going to the AIG executives' houses with bullhorns. Remember? And they were out in front of the Goldman Sachs lobbyists in my town in Washington. People were outraged. So the Republicans said, look, there's a lot of political capital here. We just want to get a piece of it. So they go to Rom. Rom goes to the president in a big meeting in the White House. And he says, Mr. President, an extraordinary thing's happened. You know, this is bipartisanship. You keep talking about that. I've got Republican senators coming to me saying, let's do it. Let's do it now. Let's be tough. And he says in a, in a phrase that I'm sure a lot of you will like, he says, Mr. President, now's the time for Old Testament justice. <laughs> Bingo. Now, Obama, hmm, that is interesting, Ron. You betcha. Hmm. But then Tim Geithner and Larry Sommers say, oh, I don't know. Uh, that sort of action, first it'll take longer than Rom thinks to do financial reform, and it'll create regulatory uncertainty and uh, overhang, caution. And that's what he went with. But Republicans and Democrats were together. In crisis, they tend to be. The problem is we don't want to have to wait for another crisis. Okay, you. Could, could you say something about the relation of Hillary and Obama? Yeah, you know, Hillary, Barack, Bill, I mean, what a trio. <laughs> Just as a narrative writer, I mean, you wait your whole life, for, you know, for a cast of characters like that. And Hillary and Barack have a, a Barack, I shouldn't call he's the president, sorry. They have a very complex relationship. I think there's a lot of frankness in it. Uh, you know, Hillary is tough, and she is experienced, and she's a very good negotiator, which he's not that great with. And Hillary, she can take the knife out. And, um, and I think, you know, she's just focused on doing a really, really good job on the foreign stage, and, ha and she has. She's got enormous respect around the world, because she sits across from world leaders, even tough guys, and like, <laughs> what, are you kidding me? <laughs> And having said that, there are a lot of reviewers who say there are a lot of women who are heroes in the book, and there kind of are, you know? And it's not because I've got some, you know, pre-existing condition. Well, I actually do. And, you know, I'm married to a strong woman who, you know, has made my life possible. But having said that, you know, the women sort of step up in this book. You know, they're kind of no nonsense. They're like, enough already. The, you know, all the tough women in Washington on financial stuff and on the economy, they're all women. You know, the men are often, you know, <laughs> I shouldn't say this. Are we taping this? Are we off the record? Some of the men have um, a little, I find they have a little bit of envy. toward the strong men of Wall Street. It's unseemly. But the women don't. And the women basically time and again, whether it's Brooksley Bourne or, uh, or Sheila Bayer, you know, she's, ooh, she's, she's in the book, she's tough. Of course, Elizabeth Warren, my, whoa, she's in the book. She's the opening scene in the book. And some reviewers said, this was a sus guy and was doing a setup here. Why? Because Warren was speaking in the fierce tones that people thought Obama would embrace. She ends up being kind of a proxy, like a vessel for the might have been with Obama. So the opening scene of the book in the fall, right before the midterm shellacking, it's Obama and Elizabeth Warren and Tim Geithner, the three of them, when Obama says, basically, that after all this hubbub, that Elizabeth Warren, who from her law school office at Harvard, you know, dreams up this idea for an agency in Washington to really protect people against the predations of the financial system. And you don't blame the financial system. If they can do it and make money, they're gonna do it. It's just the way the world works. But they ought to be protected. She comes up with this consumer agency, dreams it up, breathes it into life herself. And then there are rap videos. I mean, when was the last time a regulator had rap videos written about them? She was like Ralph Nader with attitude <laughs> and address. And you know, it was, it was right there for him. 
It's like, again, there's stories here. It's just a big story of who we are. And I don't say yay or nay. I just let it unfold. It's a drama of the times. And there are a lot of characters. They weave in and out just like in a novel or a movie. But you can feel what people are feeling in present tense. You can't look back 2020 hindsight. That's not what we do. I just let them go forward. So here we have Elizabeth Warren standing next to Tim Geithner and the president. And he gets up there, even after all the hubbub and all the base, mind you, from the campaign is like, just make her the head of the agency. It'll energize the base. I mean, you've neglected them. You haven't, you just abandoned them after the amazing 08 campaign. You know, I write in there, you know what they like? They're like an army that is, you know, just sitting there eating up the leftover rations. You know, most of them have drifted back home. There are a couple field marshals, a couple generals left. They're like, the pointer! Obama gives her a head fake. Nope. Uh, so uh, she's going to help us stand up the agency, and, but she won't be the head of it. <sighs> and Elizabeth Warren <laughs> has a meeting right before this when she kind of is auditioning for the big job. And let me just tell you one thing a Wall Street guy said to me, which gets right to the heart of it. I said, what's your deal with Elizabeth Warren? I don't get it. What she really wants to do is just restore the basic regulatory structure. You know, just, you know, consumer education, you know, from Roosevelt to Reagan. You know, I mean, uh, anti-fraud stuff. I said, you know, you guys on Wall Street, you're not officially in favor of fraud, right? I mean, <laughs> what's the big deal with, uh, with Warren? Well, it's not, no, it's not that stuff. That's just, you know, no, no, it's not that at all. This guy says, very self-satisfied guy, but it was late at night, and he was feeling uh, he's ready to commit some truth. No, no, it's not that, Ron. It's that she's playing on a cultural landscape that Obama used to play on as to who we ought to be and all that stuff. We thought Obama would do that, but he didn't. No, she's doing it. But, but look, if she gets that job, here's the problem, is that she'll get replicated by a thousand. <laughs> that the financial crisis would have created one actual innovation. A rock star regulator <laughs> will be toast. Really talented people will go down there and they'll want to serve their whole life in public service under her. Look, instead of waiting, oh, when's my lobbying shot coming up? Oh, let me check my watch. Oh, I get to leave government and make 18 times what I used to make unwinding everything I did. No, no, we can't let her get the job. We got to kill her. They did. But right before, this gets back to the women, right before she's auditioning for the job in the White House and she's going through advisor to advisor. Now Axelrod and Valerie Jarrett, they wanted her for the job because they said this will energize our political team, our army. But Larry Summers and Tim Geithner, no, 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 no. And finally she sees Christina Romer, okay, woman to woman, I love this. And Romer's on the way out the door and she's the one who's been pushing for more stimulus, you know, for Obama and to embrace sort of moral action in, you know, do something, we have a jobs crisis. But Romer's leaving and she's a little skeptical even about Warren herself because Tim and Larry are so forcefully opposed to her. So Warren sits with Romer, the two ladies in Romer's office, and Warren makes her pitch. Here's what I want to do. She wants to start right off the bat, even before she's confirmed, to have like a Procora hearings. I, I, can get a, I can get a room in Washington. I'll call the Wall Street guys in front of my committee. I'll tear them to shreds. <sighs> We'll set the dialogue. We'll create it. And finally, Romer looks at her. And she's sitting there. She's like, God, you know, I'm with you now. I'm, okay, I'm on you. I'm with you. You count me in. You know, but she says, why is it always the women? You know, we're the only ones with any balls around here. <laughs> You wait your whole life for a quote like that. Okay. The, uh, I, I'm just going to finish up um, quickly with a little thing that I do think about along with my big Basset Hound friend, Sam Irvin. Um, 
And it's something that's sort of interesting. The, the first book that I talked about, A Hope in the Unseen, where I follow my young friend from the blighted urban terrain to the Ivy League. Well, apparently it's, it's Obama's, one of his favorite books. And, um, uh, and he's been talking about it, and we used to talk about it, and, and uh, of course I've been talking about it for years. It was published in 1998. I write this book, and we're driving through Washington, through Cleveland Park, with my wife, the, and my kids are in the back seat, and we hear a grainy thing on the radio. It's Martin Luther King's birthday. And NPR, uh, obviously I'm an NPR listener, as many of you are, I'm sure, uh, they're running this old grainy tape from way back, early 60s, where, where King is in a backwater church. And he's explaining to those gathered that the anthem of that movement, I think the great social movement of the 20th century, no doubt about that, will be we shall overcome. Now, of course, in the churches, it was always I shall overcome, a statement of personal testimony, individual. And King says, no, it's got to be we. Because you do something big, something that changes the path of who we are, well, you got to stick together. So it should be we shall overcome, because we, up ahead, will be reviled. We will be spat upon. We will be hated. And some of us, some of us will suffer physical death, so others will not know the psychological death of ignorance, bigotry, of racism. And you can hear, even on the old tape, you can hear the church get quiet as though their champion has dropped his sword. And you can hear King in a call and response responding. He says, no, no, be not deterred, be not deterred. He says, you see, and he says this amazing thing. He says, you see, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. Oh. After all he'd been through, already by the early 60s, and all he was certain and right was in store for him. The arc of the moral universe is long and bends towards justice, bends towards justice. And we're listening, my wife and I drive in the car and we start bawling. And of course the kids are in the back seat like, ah! <laughs> Dad's crying, what's he? My wife's like, it's progress, kids, it's progress, it's a good thing. But I thought about that for months after that, about the arc. It's running around in my head. And then it kind of hits me. That arc does not bend on its own. It bends because people of shared purpose in this extraordinary place get into the game. You know, we're hearing so much about that now. These movements cropping up. People saying, I got to do it myself. No one's going to do it for me. Be a part of the times in which we live. Be an actor. Don't just be in the sidelines. It bends because people of shared purpose grab it and pull with all of their might. And what's hopeful about this is Obama does have this line stitched into the rug of the Oval Office. It's his favorite line. The question is, who will bend the ark? If he doesn't, someone will. And nights like this give me hope that there are plenty of people with plenty of strength ready to pull it with all their money. So thanks for coming out tonight.